fascinating to think about what would it sound like if Jimi Hendrix used a modern amp whether that was a two rock a Bartel a modern Fender even a modern Marshall perhaps uh, so as part of my Voodoo Child Chronicle series I'm going to be throwing in these videos where I basically play bits of Voodoo Child through one of those amps whilst also discussing another aspect of this whole crazy deep down tone journey that I'm going on Okay, I just wanted to jump in here. Over here in the UK, we have a phrase or a little thing, it's called Captain Obvious. And if someone makes an obvious uh, statement, then we just might say, oh, Captain Obvious. So a couple of you that have uh, chimed in in the comments to say, um, obviously you can't ever sound like this you know, track because you're not Jimi Hendrix and you don't have his fingers and you're not Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I think we know that. So. When I say, what would Jimi Hendrix sound like with a two rock or any other thing, what I'm saying is, here's a two rock. I'm gonna play something that's like what Jimmy played, but I'm playing it. And so I don't expect it to sound exactly like that. It's a bit of fun. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you could start with video number one and video number two. This is video number three. Now, before I get to the amp itself, um, I thought I'd talk about these strings. So. I put on a set of these Fender Jimi Hendrix official strings, which are a 10 to 38 gauge. That is 10, 13, 15, 26, 32, 38. I just wanted to say first, these are the nickel plated ones and they're also hex core. So they're, these are more modern, even though they get the right gauge. I'm gonna use these for a little while and then in a future video, I'm gonna to change to the complete nickel strings. So not nickel plated, so a bit more vintage. Same gauge, also the Fender official ones. But then I'm gonna to change to full nickel round core, which I think is probably, well, it's more authentic. At some point, I will also do like a little compilation video of these three different strings one after the other so you can hear them. But for now, I'm just gonna be putting on a set of strings and trying them for a couple of weeks before I move on. It's a complete waste of money and bad for the environment just to cut and change strings immediately within one video until I really need to. So we'll wait for that. Okay, so before we move on to hearing more Two Rock stuff, and that was the Two Rock amp at the beginning, uh, I thought it would make most sense to hear these Jimmy strings compared to the old fat strings that were on this guitar. So what I've got is the Bassman clip with the fat strings from the last video and me playing today with these thinner strings. Let's see what the sound difference is, the playing difference is, and we'll talk about it in a minute. <laughs>
first thing is I actually really like these strings. Um, I like the feel of them. And uh, who knew that Fender made strings? I mean, it seems obvious, but I've never actually tried them before. <laughs> I got to give kudos to Fender. They actually put official Fender colors on the ball ends, which look like the real colors. In fact, the packaging I showed you at the beginning of the video wasn't the real colors, but on the actual ball ends, it was real colors. That's good. Um, but look, I like the feel of them. Um, with some styles of playing, you want to sort of dig in and play harder, like Stevie Ray Vaughan. But with Jimmy, Jimmy had such a free style of playing that I think these light strings, and this is tuned down a whole tone as well, they suit really well. You've got more freedom to bend to crazy, you know, high bends, um, and just more flexibility, I feel. Yeah, I really liked it. Rather than digging in too hard, it makes you feel a bit more flexible, which is a good thing. The other thing is there's generally just less sort of output, I would say. Um, Jimmy wanted to turn his amps right up, you know? He was playing big venues without PA systems, so that's why he had those massive stacks. Um, and having the lighter strings meant you could crank them up but not get too muddy or too overdriven. You know, he's playing often quite clean and then with a fuzz, and you just wanna give more dynamic range, basically. Um, the downsides, well, my guitar may not be set up perfectly for it. If I bend uh, the 15th fret of the high E string, it chokes out. If I bend the B string, it can choke out. By the time you get to the G, it's okay and I can do a big bend. So I need to like think about how to set my guitar up better for that. But I am glad I put these on at this early stage of the series because it will affect how you set up the amps. There was significantly less output with the new strings than the old. You know, the settings on the amp and the fuzz and everything were identical and it was just louder with the old strings and a bit more overdriven. So I will have to turn things up a bit with the thin strings and um, that's cool. Now we haven't got to changing the pick yet. I think I might do that in the next video. The last couple of days, just in my own time, I've been playing with a much thinner pick than normal. I think it will make quite a big difference, but we'll talk about that when it comes to doing that. A two rock classic reverb. What if Jimmy had used a two rock classic reverb? Right, let's have a look at this amp. Okay, so this is my 100 watt two rock classic reverb, but it is running through the power station up there. In a minute, I'm gonna show you the volume on my decibel meter with the power station on and with the power station off before my wife gets home because it's pretty loud. And um, well, I you know, tend to use the fryer when I'm gonna be pushing an amp like this as loud as that the master is on three quarters, the gain is on three quarters. It's uh, pretty epic. But I also wanna just try it on its 50 watt mode in a second, just to see how it will cope uh, with that, given the amount of fuzz and everything that I'm using. Um, the other thing is I put it in the lower gain structure setting, the one on the bottom. That is, it's more vintage sounding, black face sounding setting. Because Jimmy, you know, used an old amp, well, not old at the time, which we may believe was a blackface dual showman, may, maybe not, but um, could well have been. But I think we should try the other two settings here on the gain structure. The other thing I want you to notice is how I've set the treble, middle and bass the same as each other. Quite often for any given thing I'm doing on this amp, the bass would be somewhere back at 10 o'clock whilst the treble and middle are wherever I need them to be because it is a two by 12 cab that can otherwise be very bassy. But I'm gonna even push the bass up a little bit further. The one other thing I wanna try is pulling the gain back quite far back, but pushing the master maybe even a little bit more. The reason I wanna do that is because Jimmy would have been using, you know, a non-master volume amp, which would have had less gain on tap than this. Um, the 85 watt dual showman with two JBL 15 inch speakers may well be a purely clean amp even when you set it almost as loud as it can go. So let's start by going through all the things I've just said and we'll finish by turning off the fryer and seeing how loud that is. <laughs>
So, so far I think the two rocks doing a pretty good job. I think part of it is the two by 12 cab. It's gonna give out more bass than the four by 10 basement in that sense, or more room filling bass at least. But I think it's doing a really great job of getting that big clean low end, but a little bit more compression in the top end, which is what I've been missing so far. In the second setting I've just done with the top gain structure, I think it was even better than it was in the black face setting, which I wasn't expecting because I thought obviously the vintage black blackface setting would be more like the original, but I thought having that top gain structure, so the default T-Rock would give it, gives it a bit more compression on the top end, which is something I've been missing. Now when we flick it into the middle one, I think it may get even closer. It seems to me that even when you go up to the next gain structure, the middle one, which has the highest output, maybe it gets even closer or somewhere between the two. And what I've always liked with the two rock is even when you're increasing the gain, it doesn't necessarily overblow the low end. It does work on increasing that top end, which is what two rock knows that you'll need more of. Um, and that little bit of extra breakup is probably a bit, even a bit too much compared to the record. Um, it depends which version you're listening to. I'm using the Voodoo Child on Electric Ladyland. I think some people are confused or thinking of the other um, Voodoo Child, the one that's called Voodoo Child Blues, which was another take I think that was done. I, that's the one that Mills Tap actually is referring to when he's playing generally and the tones he's going for. Uh, it's a little bit different, but anyway. So with this amp, to increase the gain on the top end but not overblow the bottom end, that's working really well. So loving that. <laughs> So I think reducing the gain is probably the right idea. Maybe I reduced it a little bit too much, but this makes me consider what's going on in the record. And one of the reasons this opening section is so hair-raisingly good is because he is restrained in that gain. You know, when he hits a few top end notes, he's not putting, you know, whacking loads of fuzz or gain on it yet. That's gonna come later. So you don't wanna sort of shoot your shot or blow your load, should we say, too early on in this piece. So yeah, just restraining that a bit works well. I probably just whacked the gain up a tiny bit more just to give me that
bite on that um, bent 15 fret B, but otherwise, yeah, I think that's going in the right direction. <laughs> Increasing that bass, I think that brought us even closer, but this is where we have to consider the sort of post-processing outboard effects that Jimmy and Eddie Kramer used to get the final record. If you have so much bass with the amp, then when you put the plate and room sort of stuff on, it's gonna overblow that. That's just the way it will probably work. So the previous setting was probably better in the end. If you were playing live, you might well, um, put it on this you know if you're not going to add any big reverb effects because you just have the room in front of you then great I think this sounded great for what it was in the room but when it comes to doing the recording it's probably a bit too much bass but another thing about the two rock is it's so sculptable compared to some amps that I've, I've had um, and they're sympathetic to what you really want so it never gets too mushy or anything right you, they each part of the spectrum has its own distinct controls, shall we say. It doesn't it doesn't ruin the rest of it. I'm maybe not explaining that very well, but it works. Okay, that was just a bit of fun and unfortunately the mics did clip quite a lot there, but understandably that was pretty crazy loud. That was pretty crazy loud. Now bear in mind that that um, decibel meter is what, five to six feet behind the amps in what is actually quite a large room, um, you know, relatively speaking. So that's pretty loud. I mean, for a lot of people you just wouldn't, well, you wouldn't be able to use that in most situations, but Great fun. Now, having the fryer on actually helps though because the fryer is quite a magic thing. As anyone who comments about, oh, you should use a fryer, I already use a fryer. Um, I know, the fryer works wonders in many ways. So it allows you to get more out of your amp and it and that shows in this video. I think the clips with the fryer were better, even though the one without was recorded with some clipping, you could still tell. That was fun to do it for a minute in the room. But after this week of playing through the Marshall, JTM, the basement, and now the two rock, my ears are absolutely blown. So I might need to start putting some, uh, I sometimes do wear like the ear attenuating buds. I think they need to go back in for the next few days just to, to help take some of the edge off. Well look, this, as, as I said, for me, this is all just great fun. Some of you may be um, taking it a bit seriously in the comments in the sense of saying to me, why don't you just follow your own, your own tone journey? Why try and recreate what someone else has done? Yeah, I do my own thing as well. I've been doing it for four years on YouTube. So to be honest with you, those comments are sort of wasted on me because this series is happening nonetheless. I love it. Um, like 
I've received so many messages from people besides comments who are doing similar things and it's just a bit of fun, right? Allow yourself to have some fun for God's sake. It doesn't, not everything has to have like a huge meaning to it. Um, and uh, trust me when I say I've spent my whole life worrying about things having, having to have meaning. Sometimes you can just have fun, but there is a reason for doing this beyond just getting the tone, right? Having, in, in your playing career, so to speak, you go through lulls and you go through motivated periods. I was going through a little bit of a lull, wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. And this idea came up on me sort of organically over time as I got more and more into learning my Hendrix stuff. And it's given me a huge boost, which means for several weeks or months, I have so much energy, right? Because we all, we, we push our energies in so many different places in life. And sometimes we burn out a little bit. And for me, having this particular thing to concentrate on day in and day out, it's giving me a huge amount of energy to learn some more playing, to learn more about how to set my gear up, to learn recording techniques. Could Jimmy have used a two rock? Yes. If he was around now, would he be using a two rock? I have no doubts he would have at least played a two rock, if not be playing a two rock mostly. I think that um, given his interest in gear, and his interest in gear is, um, it's a curious one. I think he, um, he wasn't a gearhead in the way some of us are now because he didn't have the sentimentality of history that we have. He um, wanted an amp that could get out into the room. That was his main concern with the amps. That's why he went through so many different amps. Is it big enough sounding? Does it do what he needs? It doesn't flub out on him because he's pushing even 100 watt amps, he's pushing it so hard. And with the guitars, well, as they said, he would go through so many guitars and from the early 60s ones through to the late 60s ones. A lot of them weren't that great, um, but he would just try a few and pick one. I don't think he overthought it per se. One that held a lot of his sentimental sort of love was his, his Black Beauty, the Black Strat that he played in sort of 68 onwards, which he left to a girlfriend when he died. But other than that, guitars were pretty changeable for him. If he saw him using one, a new one or something, it might just be because his main guitar wasn't with him or a string had broken or something, right? He just picked up another one. They were pretty just off the shelf. I mean, that is what a Strat is supposed to be. Um, it's a good lesson for me, I guess, but times have changed and our way of thinking about guitars has changed. Still, I find it all fascinating. And the next video, I'm not sure what the next video will be because I've got a couple of options. I might be thinking about, can you make this sound through a Hot Rod Deluxe? That might be the next video. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this one. I'll see you on the next one.